maybe now we're live. Yes. <laughs> All right. Welcome, everybody. Um, April uh, 2023, Merge PHP. Uh, we are live and in person and online this month. Um, try, trying out um, a new format uh, and uh, welcome everybody who could join us online um, and in person. Uh, I, I think we're we're set up. There may be a few snags as we kind of like switch back and forth between um, speakers in person, but uh, you know we'll we'll uh, do our best, and we're glad you could make it. Um, so um, if you're new here, uh, we typically do through run through these intro slides, uh, and then we'll um, introduce the speakers and get started. So. Uh, bear with us. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Merge PHP. Um, uh, at, so we are a collection of, of user groups. You can see the list here, and I'll go through some details here for each of the groups. Uh, so Atlanta PHP, um, uh, you can see, you know, they're um, founded in 2004, and um, uh, you know, run by Chris. Uh, so and Chris is is here tonight. So. If you would like a, a JetBrains license, he has a copy to give away. Um, first person to email Chris at atlantaphp.org wins the license. So get your emails ready and, and fire it off to Chris, and uh, we will give away a license to JetBrains. And if you already have PHP Storm, uh, the license works for um, uh, DataGrip or other JetBrains products. So uh, thanks to Chris for managing that. Uh, Austin PHP, that's me and Ian. Ian is there in person um, and I am running things uh, remotely. Uh, and that's some information about us. Um, check out our, our PHP conference, uh, Longhorn PHP, uh, usually in the fall. Uh, Boston PHP, that's Bobby um, and Gene. Gene. Gene is there in chat. Um, and welcome every, everybody from Boston. Um, uh, they do a virtual self-study group uh, in addition to these uh, um, virtual uh, meetups. And uh, go check out uh, the Boston PHP meetup uh, if you're interested in doing uh, self-study courses. They usually do um, a handful of them, about one a quarter, I would say. Um, I could be off, but Gene, Gene will correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, so check it out, and that's a good way to skill up um and yeah that's boston uh so seattle um welcome ready from seattle that's tim he's, he's uh, I, I don't know if you can see tim um but uh that uh, yep there's in information about seattle and we've been working hard on a new website for everybody uh so thank you tim for uh coordinating that and putting in uh the majority of the work uh, on that, and it, we'll we'll get it ready soon. It's not uh, we're we're still finishing up a few things, so stay tuned for that. Uh, Vancouver PHP, uh, our our first international group. Uh, if anyone's had a chance to visit Vancouver, definitely check out PHP Vancouver. Uh, so PHP Vegas, that is um, Vegas programmers on Meetup. Uh, that's run by Josh Copeland. Uh, his company, Remote Dev Force, sponsors um, Merge PHP. So, so check out Remote Dev Force. Um, I believe he's caught up with work stuff right now, but uh, he should be joining us later. Um, KC PHP. I believe we have a couple people from KC uh, here tonight. That's Eric, um, Dan, and John. Um, and uh, check out uh, KC PHP if you're in uh, the Kansas City area, Missouri. Um, area there uh, they they um, usually have you know in-person stuff at, at coffee shops um, and you know really appreciate them being involved in the group as well uh, Utah PHP that's Mark and Derek and we've got uh, Derek here um, tonight uh, as, and uh, we're they're they're uh, if you're in the Utah area Salt Lake City, I'm I'm assuming it's Salt Lake City. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, definitely check out Utah PHP. Uh, San Diego PHP. That's uh, John and Eric. Um, uh, so if you're in the South 
uh, California, at, you know, uh, check out um, San Diego. And we have a discount code uh, for Merge, uh, sorry, it's <laughs> for PHP Tech. Uh, and we'll have some more details here coming up in, in the next slides. Uh, but that, that discount code link does work now. Um, I checked it beforehand. So uh, thank you for John and Eric for being involved uh, in Merge PHP. Uh, and our monthly reminder um, uh, about support in PHP versions, uh, the obligatory slide for uh, supported versions. Um, if you're on a version before 8.0, um, you should probably talk to somebody uh, in charge and, and uh, start working on a migration plan. Upcoming conferences. Um, so there's uh, you know a lot going on this year for sure in in PHP um, and uh, the, the the big one here it, you know hopefully you bought your ticket to PHP Tech um, in Chicago that's coming up here um, in just under um, or just over a month um, at PHP Tech's always a great time um, and uh, Eric did you want to say a few words? Uh, no, I'm just hoping to see everybody there. But we've been putting a lot of work into it and uh, hoping for a great conference. We got got a wonderful lineup of speakers, including several people who are in our little chat now. So, uh, hope to see everybody there in Chicago. All right, thanks, Eric. Uh, looking forward to it. Um, yeah, so lo lots of stuff going on um, this year. Uh, definitely a lot of international stuff. Um, uh, Nashville Laricon. Um and uh yeah um that that's that's um that's it for com conferences I'm sure we'll have some more details here uh as I update this slide um for next month uh check us out on the social medias uh and you know php.social um and definitely like and subscribe on YouTube uh it definitely hits us out uh, helps us out uh, we're pretty close to hitting that 200 subscriber mark, um, so we would appreciate some some help there, uh, getting getting those numbers up. Um, all right, so this month we're going to be uh, talking about um, uh, multi-value indexes and static analysis. We have a lightning talk and then a full talk. Um, Daniel is, uh, I believe, first uh, with the lightning talk. Uh, and mm -hmm. then Hunter is going to be uh, speaking um, uh, second on the type safety talk. Uh, so I'm going to pass it over. I'm going to leave it here and and pass it over to Ian. It might give us a few minutes. It might be, um, uh, you know, while we get the laptop stuff ready. Um, but we'll we're get good. started. We're good. Um, so we're actually flipping it. Uh, because apparently Daniel forgot how bad Austin traffic was, so he's not here yet. Uh, okay. So we're starting with Hunter and type safety and compilation checks. With that, I'll get out of the way and let him present. Great. Well, I got to say, it's been a long time since I've done an in, in-person presentation for a meetup or in general since COVID happened. So both exciting to be back and maybe like nerve-wracking but we'll all get through it together and it's going to be a great time or I will gladly take the feedback to make it better next time. Uh, this is a new talk that I've been working on. I originally had this idea to kind of sell the idea more to my coworkers, and then Ian started asking for speakers and I opened my mouth and here I am today. So I want to talk to you about the benefits of static analysis and how it can empower your teams to develop better code. All of us here in one way or another have benefited from PHP and JavaScripts, dynamic typing, which allows us to move pretty quickly from prototypes to finished products. However, as apps grow in complexity and significance in our everyday lives, the absence of type safety and compilation checks can be felt. Uh, no need to fret though, because today I'll show you how you can have your dynamic cake and type safely, eat it to Check out these damn fist. All right, what is dynamic typing? Before we dive into static analysis, let's make sure we're all on the same page. PHP and JavaScript are dynamically typed languages. <clears throat> Using the textbook definition, we know that dynamically typed languages are those where the interpreter assigns variables 
a type at runtime based on their value. So if we take a look at some PHP, you might recognize this code. Maybe I have pretty a uh, standard create user function, but what does it really mean? For, like, what does dynamic type of mean for us? Well, we can write code like this. We don't really care what the name or age type is. We just know we want to create a user and we need name and age. Typically that'd be a string and a number, but uh, it does mean a type. Technically speaking, all of these here are valid options of PHP code. Probably not what you're expecting though in your application because due to PHP, <laughs> dynamic typing and some type version, our first user is gonna be correct. Hunter 30, great. When we get Joe, the string 24 is gonna work out for us fine because PHP is smart enough to make it the integer 24 we're all great frankie on the other hand is going to be one year old that's probably not what we're looking for unless frankie's a baby maybe frankie is a baby and maybe your application supports babies in which case this is probably going to work out for you maybe but it's still a bug technically and then finally we have the last option where we've put the age in the name slot and we somehow put the string age where age should go. And technically speaking, this is all going to work. Their name will be the string 42, but it's going to convert the string of age to zero. And that's, that's where we get into some really weird territory because I, maybe somebody's named 42. I, not sure they have a great relationship with their parents if that's what they named them, but I don't think we really are looking or expecting for an age to zero. Once again, unless your application has babies, I understand there's like months old concept, but stick with me here. It is a bit contrived, but you kind of get you get the point of where I'm going. <clears throat> Meanwhile, in JavaScript, here's a really fun bug that exists because of its dynamic typing and the type portion. You can see the breakdown of what happens, but effectively JavaScript is first evaluating that three is less than two. That's not correct, that's false. But then that becomes the, for the next part of the check, we get the Boolean false being less than one. Since false converts to zero in most languages as an integer, zero is in fact less than one. But that's not what we expect. We expect this to be false because three is not less than two and two is not less than one. But due to dynamic typing and type coercion, we run into situations like this. Once again, this is slightly contrived, but by me just to get the point across. So you were probably asking me, cool, but how do we catch these types of bugs? Well, where languages like Java or Rust or Go or whatever the new hotness is that's compiled would prevent us from even compiling this code in the first place because it's not valid code in those languages. You need to actually pay attention to and respect types and pass them along appropriately. And without that, your code's just not even gonna compile it, but allowing you to easily catch the bug. And then PHP and JavaScript would just let it through. Oops, not really what we're looking for. But we can solve this though with my friend static analysis. And I hopefully it'll be your friend soon too. What is static analysis? You may be asking. Well, pulling from the textbook definition, I know, Yon City, but it's a really helpful definition of a method of debugging that is done by automatically examining the source code. <clears throat> excuse me, without having to execute the program. More specifically, Static code analysis is taking a set of code and comparing it against a set of rules, and those rules vary from language to language, but are designed to help you find potential bugs you may have missed. There's some other use cases for static analysis, too, that I'll touch on a little bit later in the presentation, but that is the general strokes of it. Okay, great, I know, but how? How do we do this? <clears throat> uh, patience, personality, I just gave the slide, worrying psychologists everywhere in Austin. Uh, right now, in fact, we're going to dive into how we do this and take a look at the analysis scene in PHP, and then we'll transition into JavaScript in a moment. So 
One of the first tools and the one that I personally have the most experience with is PHP Stand. PHP Stand scans your old code base and looks for bugs that are both obvious and tricky and even can help you find those uh, bugs that are in the rarely executed if statements that are probably not covered by test cases. If there are test cases, please let there be test cases. But one of the things I like about PHP Stand is the ability to gradually integrate the tool into your projects through various <clears throat> levels of rules. You can slowly add static analysis to your project without becoming immediately overwhelmed by a deluge of errors. I uh, I forgot to snag the screenshot I'm into, but an example of this overwhelming is a code base that we'll kind of look at a little bit. It on first pass with PHP stand, this is an acquired product, uh, over a thousand errors in that code. And uh, yeah, as someone who has to maintain it, can definitely feel that. So, but that's, like, there's no way we're gonna be able to fix all thousand of those bugs before we start using it. So that's just not gonna happen. It's just like, no, you have features to work on. Jump, jump. So PHP stand with its gradual rules makes it to where we can, you know, roll it in slowly but surely without getting like, holy shit, you got to fix over a thousand bugs to get this going. No one likes that. Another really cool thing about PHP stand and uh, the other tool we'll be looking at too has this as well, but I personally prefer PHP stands better, but this is the online playground that PHP stand hosts on their site. So you can actually start just pasting PHP code into this just to see how it works without having to install or configure anything in your project on your machine. Here you go. And in this case, we can actually, <clears throat> you know, it shows the issues we got going on. And, you know, let's take a moment to look at this. Like why, what, what's wrong with this code? Well, the uh, sharp eyed of y'all will probably notice that there's a typo. Immutable has two M's, not one. So the first error we're getting on line five is that the type hint is invalid because there is no date time immutable with one M, so it's gonna fail. And then secondly, the, it is smart enough to even go one step further and go like, hey, you're trying to call method format that uh, doesn't exist on this unknown class. So that's probably a bug too. And, you know, real quick, we fix the typo and boom, all of our errors are fixed. And it's that easy most of the time. There are some complex type cases that have come up depending on your application. But thankfully with things like Laravel, Symfony, and all these other frameworks becoming first class citizens in tools like PHP Stan, some of those like framework caused issues where your application code and framework code kind of cross boundaries are becoming less of a problematic area for type testing tools. Hey, question. So um, for specifically for Laravel and Symfony, what's like the current like up to date way to integrate those with PHP Stand? So PHP Stand has a like plugin or extensions uh, functionality to it. So the there is a popular package called Laristan that basically just maintains the extra rules and extension tokens to tell PHP Stand how to work with parts of Laravel. Is that still like up to date? Yeah. Oh, okay. it's being it's being maintained by uh, Nunguru, I think. Uh, I don't know he's still the one focusing on it, but I know he's only started the project. And then there's you know extensions for Symphony to add support for that framework into the system and many others. And then there's official plugins, unofficial that other people have worked on. You know, the open source community will sometimes duplicate a lot of work and do things better or worse one way or another. But PHP stands extensions are all really good. We actually, for some of our projects, will even use additional extensions that uh, allow us to get some support with our projects. We use the Doctrine ORM instead of Eloquent. But obviously, you want Laristan. There's something like Laristan to come in to help you with Laravel's, you know, usage of magic methods and all that jazz. Another thing that has helped is that recently, I guess that was the beginning of the year, so not too recently, but we're also already in May somehow, so time's flying. Laravel 10 came out, and it is the first version of the framework that started adding type hints to 
damn near everything so that it'll be more supported by the framework or by tools like PHP SAM, SOM, which we'll be looking at in a moment, or even just better IDE integration and help there. So as we're, as PHP is kind of starting to move towards and embrace types more uh, directly with, without requiring you to use them still with this handy dandy declare strip types up at the top of the file. Uh, everything is getting better and just going to help us write better code for our customers. So, so I admittedly do not have a lot of experience with this tool. Like I said, we use PHP standard. Uh, my day job, but it is definitely a tool that it's worth looking into and learning about. It'd be a travesty if I didn't mention the other, one of the other big players in static analysis for PHP. SOM has a lot of the same goals as PHP stand. One of, I think, the slight differences is that uh, PHP stand is kind of managed by Andres. And that team, while SOM was developed by Vimeo and their engineering department. So slightly different focuses, addition, like things that exist and do not exist there, but really it's aiming for, uh oh okay, we're back. Everything just flickered for a second. Uh, it's really trying to do the same thing. They have this really great article that I'll make sure to share on some of my socials at some point. Are we still good, Ian? Yep. Okay. Uh, and that that article really does a deep dive even further into type safety and why it's important. I think it's a great compliment to this uh, presentation, but they also go one step further and identify that types are also not necessarily always needed. I'm very particular and weird uh, by calling coding my like craft. So when I work on my hobby projects at home, I still use types all over my code because that's just my way of constantly honing my craft and staying on top of it. But you really don't have to because it's a hobby project. And yeah, do what works for you. Types that definitely help out, probably not as necessary on hobby projects. But let's dive into some examples and away from this impromptu soapbox which just created on hobby projects. So in Psalm's own words, bugs creep in when types can't be inferred. This bug is particularly unique because it involves PHP's arrays. You may, uh, you may know that PHP's arrays are actually pretty damn powerful. It's probably one of the more powerful features in PHP, but they're also used to represent like three different data structures in the language. You use them to represent lists, you use them to represent associative arrays, and you can even use them to create makeshift structs. Because of this uh, flexibility, of this one data type, though, it can be easy to make mistakes if you're not careful. In this case, this is gonna this is gonna fail because you can't echo uh, standard class. It's not gonna you can't echo the string length of standard class. I mean, because well, it's not a string. And but all this is valid PHP. You could throw this out in production; it wouldn't go well for you. But you could. It would compile. It would run. If we do a quick little change here and add one of the supported doc blocks by Psalm to type in that the array we receive should be keyed by ints with values of string, we immediately now get this nice lovely red squiggly telling us, hey, this is a bug. This is not valid. You need to fix this. However, this happened and just make it go away. We can even using this other example, we have this function called get first or default. We've added more type hints in, so we know we want an array. We have a string for a default. And if the array exists on empty, we get the first item from it. Otherwise, we return the default. You'll see some similar functions like this in Laravel and other frameworks that have default returns, like say on the collection methods. But without PHP or without Psalm's list type, that is not native to PHP doc, which is why you have to use the Psalm param instead of param, the regular param a doc block. You are now telling Psalm and your IDE with the integration and all that fun jazz that the array should be a list of strings, which means it needs to be a numeric, numerically indexed array starting at zero. 
you can't just start a list at one. It has to start at zero. And this is not going to work for us because we're trying to return what's at the first or the first offset or zero offset. But this starts at one. Everything's a disaster. But with this nice solid frame, we can actually catch this bug. Because without this valid, completely valid PHP code would would execute, probably throw some warnings or an exception, depending on your configuration. And the last thing we want users in production to be experiencing are exceptions, let alone warnings about us making mistakes, because that doesn't uh, build confidence and trust that we know what we're doing when we build these products. So this is incredibly helpful. I believe PHP Stan has the list too. For every Psalm param, there is also an equivalent at PHP stand dash param doc block annotation. These are just, you don't have to use those. These are just for when you're trying to document a type that is outside of what PHP comes with. So in this case, you would just put at param dollar sign array is an array. You could go one step closer and document it as a string array, you know, string with the open close square brackets, but that's only going to use you so far. It's not going to help you catch this type of bug. Yes, Daniel. Since I'm waiting, I already told you this. Is there a uh, that there's specific things like that will understand? So both tools will understand the built in doc blocks that, like, that exist like at template and at param, at return, things like that. These are primarily there so that you can document the type correctly in case the IDE doesn't understand. Like the IDE, like PHP Storm isn't going to immediately understand what you mean by, oh, this parameter is a list because list doesn't exist in the PHP language. But this is telling Psalm that, hey, this is supposed to be a list style or list shaped array. For regular API documentation of PHP, you just do at param array dollar sign r. Is there a working on common syntax that they get? I there is a lot of go ahead, yeah. Uh, they go ahead and repeat the question when it when it's asked just because. Oh yeah, that is a very good point. Thank you. Uh, for the live stream, Daniel's question was uh, first if there were if these tools understood the non-vendor prefixed annotations in DocBlock. And then the second question or follow-up question to that was, is there a like standard that these tools are using or starting to work towards? Is that an accurate representation, Daniel? I, that I don't know. I do know that there is some overlap in what both tools support and how they function. So like, I'm fairly certain if you change this from at psalm dash param to at php stand dash param and switch tools, it would work immediately because they, more or less are speaking the same language. They're borrowing the generic syntax from other languages like Java and what we keep trying to put in PHP and it keeps getting shot down one day, maybe, hopefully. Uh, so it is, these vendor prefix things are nice because it allows us to kind of do things in PHP that are not actually in PHP yet, but each tool has different focuses and strengths and weaknesses. So some might cover some cases where PHP SAM doesn't. It would be a good idea if they all move, but I think the idea would probably be to just move these things into the standard doc block types of that param and just build out support for that in the language. But that takes time and a lot of other things. Psalm has some other cool features that I like and is actually kind of maybe want to look into Psalm at work and see if it is, if we should stick with PHP Stan or maybe even look at moving to Psalm at some point. But the two ones that I want to call out are, are security analysis and code manipulation. I put these, this list in the wrong order. So we're going to talk about code manipulation first, but this is something that I believe is unique to Psalm in that it actually has the ability to automatically fix or refactor some of these bugs for you. So you don't have to manually go and contact and fix all of them. It can cover some general use cases. For example, it can help you go through your code base and add all the missing return types for your functions, methods, and even closures in your code. It has some other refactoring tools as well that are 
I think just kind of things that Vimeo threw in there because they're useful to them and I they're probably useful to others, but they do have some built-in tools where you can use Psalm to move classes between name, like from one namespace to the other for you. PHP Storm can help you automate a lot of that, but Psalm comes with it too, in case you're using an editor that doesn't support that functionality, or you want to do some of these fixes in like a CI pipeline, for example. The other cool feature is the ability to perform security analysis on your code base. We've been primarily focusing on how SOM can find application bugs through static analysis, but really most security tools also utilize a form of static analysis when examining your code base to look for those security vulnerabilities. I think where SOM excels though versus other tools that you may be familiar with is that SOM is taking its built-in type inference system, the same thing it uses to help you find bugs in PHP to provide more context into the security vulnerabilities. So it can actually help you find more real bugs. Like I'm sure we've all done a security analysis at some point and they've said, there's SQL injection right here. And technically, yes, there is a possible SQL injection there, but there is no possible way in any of the code paths it will never become a SQL injection. It's not, it's not exploitable, but you're still gonna get dinged on that security analysis and you probably wanna pull your hair out because those companies are super fun to deal with. But SOM comes in, can actually show you, hey, this security vulnerability exists and this one is actually most likely actually exploitable. When this got implemented by Vimeo, they apparently found in their words, an embarrassing amount of security uh, vulnerabilities that were actually exploitable versus the like false positive looking ones. But enough about what these tools are and do and what they look like. Let's kind of jump into some real world examples of what we're looking at. Okay, well, the formatting didn't get any better on the screen than it did on my laptop. So that's unfortunate. But the general thing to know is that in this code base, the one I mentioned earlier, that we have this value object called phone intelligence. And when running PHP STAM, it flags these two errors on lines 45 and 79. First one about an enum, it's expecting the enum, but it's actually being given either the enum or null, which is a bug. And also the two JSON method on the phone intelligence should return a string, but can technically return a string or false. And if we're expecting it to always be a string, that false is going to cause problems for us or have to bloat our code with unnecessary. If not false, then do the thing checks all over the place. Uh, so let's let's take a look at the class in question. I have trimmed a lot of this class down so that it would actually fit on a screen. But the general, you can see the constructor. You can see where this is being used or is using Laravel's cast attributes functionality with an anonymous class <clears throat> to be able to use the phone intelligence value object with our eloquent model that it's being used with instead of just having random fields of strings all over the place to work with. So we can see the first book up here in the constructor pointing for the people that probably can't see me on online, but for everyone in person, enjoy. We can see that the last constructor parameter is a line type enum. It even comes with a default option of unknown. Then we come down here into our cast using function and the anonymous class we're using to manage this casting logic with an eloquent. Here, we're constructing the new phone intelligence object, bringing in from the attributes that eloquent pull from the database. And then we're trying to build out the line type enum from the string that's in the database. Well, if you haven't had the opportunity to use enums in PHP yet, try from, uh, try from will take the value that is backing the enum. So typically a, actually I think it's can only support integers and strings at the moment. And if there is a matching enum case for that value, 
you get a the enum back. But if there isn't an action case, you get a null. And that's where PHP stain is identifying this issue. Because this constructor says, always give me a line type enum. And this usage is saying, sometimes I can give you a null, which will break the code. How can we fix this though? Well, oh wait, I should also probably talk on the other issue that was there. So two JSON, we got down here, just basic. I cut out the two array method from the code because I think we generally know how returning arrays work, but we're using the result of that, passing it into the PHP's JSON encode, give it the options to pass options through. Great, awesome. Except for JSON encode for the longest time will give you a valid JSON string if it can be encoded in JSON, or if it fails, you get false. And that's where the other bug PHP stand found comes into play. Another way to catch this would be if we had a type hint on this function. The reason we don't have a type hint on this function is that it comes from a uh, interface provided by Laravel, JSONable, and which is how PHP works. The method has to match the interface so you can't add a return type to the concrete method that is being that is implementing the interface, which is kind of annoying at times, but I get why that is the way it is. So how do we fix this? Well, we know here we have a line type <clears throat> case of unknown, and we've already taken the step here of saying like, look, if the attributes array is missing a phone type, period, and like doesn't have a value, we default to unknown. So we don't really need to use try from for the like protection there. We can just use from. From is the same as try from. The only difference is if the value provided does not match a case on the enum object, then it throws an exception, which would technically be bad in this case, since we're always passing in this unknown string, we're always gonna get a line type. So we can change the code signature to just use from, and that solves that issue in a PHP stand found. And then thankfully we're on newer versions of PHP. So we didn't have to really change the code too much onto JSON, but just simply changing JSON in code to always use the JSON throw on error option, and then tag that into any custom provided options by the user of this class and Look at that, give it another run. Green, blue is immediately my favorite color, but when I'm programming, it's green all the way. Green is what you want to see while programming. All right, I think we uh, really dove into PHP a lot. So let's talk about front end development. For those of you that are front end developers or happen to be full stack developers, you can get the same benefits we do in PHP with and the great tools that we just discussed, but things are gonna be a little bit different. So I want to introduce you to, introduce you to TypeScript. While I have my uh, issues with Microsoft as a company for one reason or another, they do occasionally uh, get things right and do cool things. And TypeScript is one of those moments in my opinion. Type what? Huh? All right, this will, I'm sure somehow by the end of this presentation, how the JavaScript uh, ecosystem goes, a, uh, a, a type what or a haunt script will somehow exist by the end of this talk. But uh, what is TypeScript exactly? Well, it is a strongly typed language that builds onto JavaScript. That means you can have a mixture of native JavaScript and TypeScript as TypeScript is at the end of the day, compiled or converted to native JavaScript because we got it for the browsers to actually be able to run it. Uh, but that way your code can be run, can be written in TypeScript and be run anywhere, be it the browser, you know, JS or Deno, in your very own apps today. Like our PHP tools, TypeScript even supports being able to gradually apply types to your JavaScript project. It's a lot easier to sell the business, the importance and usefulness of these tools when you don't have to start the conversation with, okay, first we're gonna rewrite the whole thing in TypeScript. Cause depending on your uh, leadership team, you might get laughed out of the room or maybe they'll say yes. If they say yes, that's a lot more power to y'all. Let's take a look at an example from TypeScript's documentation. Actually, this is from their homepage directly. So, we got this fancy 
handy dandy compact function. The key night of you may already see some bugs and where this is going, but stay, bear with me. No editors in this code, or no errors in this code whatsoever, or warnings in a lot of IDEs. But when you go to use it at a runtime, it crashes, and that could affect your users poorly. But we can immediately add TypeScript checks to our JavaScript code without even writing any TypeScript. All you need to do is add the comment TS check to the beginning of your file. And immediately it's going to find the first real error. And that is the variable, the incoming variable in the function is R. We're checking the length of or wrong variable. It's not going to throw an error in JavaScript because with their scoping of variables and everything, it doesn't know if or is one level higher than the function. It could be available on the window or the global object and it would still compile. But obviously this is not what we're looking for <clears throat> and it blows up. But if you say you're at the uh, how, if, if you're using like VS Code or something, you need to actually like run like a like, program to the like check it. So like what like that like program is maybe? Um, well, I'm getting to that point a little bit later, but uh, to, M. Night Shyamalan on this ESLint is one of the tools that you can use to run these checks. Like and, program. And with respect to like ES check ESLint. Yeah, so ESLint comes with a TypeScript parser, a bunch of plugins, mm -hmm. and everything, as well as like recommended rules on how to write TypeScript that's readable, functional, etc. So, uh, yeah, we'll talk a little bit about ESLint in a little bit, but simple. Simple change to our code, and we're already getting some benefits of finding bugs. But let's take it one step further. I personally don't see this often, but JavaScript does have JS doc, very similar to our PHP doc. So if we add JS doc on top of the TS check, we can find another error because now we're telling it, all right, pram r is a of type any array. That's where we find our next bug. Trim is not a function on JavaScript's arrays. The function we're actually looking for is slice, not trim. We wouldn't know that until JSDoc comes in and tells us, hey, that property doesn't exist on any arrays. And then finally, for those of you that noticed the nice handy dandy progression bars that were also on the home page and I forgot to trim out with my screenshotting. Uh, but that's fine. We get to a fully TypeScript function definition. And this, this is where it really starts to shine. TypeScript adds natural syntax for, for providing types, which is a little bit different from PHP and why the approach is different on front end because PHP has already had the ability to, you know, add type hints to your code, but it obviously it was very basic for the longest time until we got to our newer versions of PHP. But we are just defining a type of string array. This is actually something that TypeScript could do that PHP can't. In PHP code, you'd have to type into it as an array, and then in your PHP doc, specify that it is a array of strings. So an array of object type, foo. TypeScript can just immediately use the types uh, directly, natively, and say this is this compact function is expecting an array that is a string array and everything is nice, green, compiled. End users don't run into bugs. You don't have to spend time debugging it and move on to the more important things like building features for your users. TypeScript also, because of that TypeScript has some other functionalities available to it. So for example, we are able to very quickly just define this interface for, you know, like a, your typical JSON or JavaScript struct. I'll remember how to speak correctly by the end of this, I'm sure. But you can even go even further. So we're, we got this verify function. I probably don't need a function for this, but contrived examples contrived, but you can actually dynamically define your own type of result and specify that the type result should 
only be the string of pass or fail. It can't be anything else. We can't put maybe into this verify function and it work. It'll throw it'll it'll work on the browser, but it'll give us an error in TypeScript. Uh, one thing to call out, it's not really directly related to static analysis, but it does make a difference in TypeScript. TypeScript uses what is called a structural type system. What that means is that the type checking compares the members of the type. For example, if you have a type in TypeScript of goose and it shares all the same members as the type duck, then as far as TypeScript is concerned, those types are the same and interchangeable. We obviously know ducks are not goose. We even had a fun game we both played as kids to highlight that fact, but for how TypeScript works, and I think this is probably just due to how JavaScript functions at its core, it's using a more structural approach to this. There are some benefits to this. I've actually have, we don't use TypeScript at work. I'll get into that a little bit later, but I have used TypeScript for a work project to kind of just, you know, do an experiment and show the team like, hey, this is an option that we could take for building our front end applications. Check out TypeScript. I've actually been able to use that structural type system because I have two different types that are logically different, but also structurally the same. So I could just pass either into functions and they would work interchangeably and it was super great. If we have time, maybe at the end, I'll show off some of the code, but I wanna give Daniel time too. So how can we use these tools? Well, first off, we do the basic step of install. I know, basic, stay with me. Let's keep this pattern. We'll go over PHP first, and then we'll hit JavaScript, and then we'll move on. So first up in PHP, straightforward, our favorite tool composer, require, we want to keep this as a dev dependency because we probably don't need these static analysis tools in production. Unless your tool is a static analysis tool in production, then maybe you do. But PHP Stam, PHP Stam, Vimeo, Psalm. Once again, highlighting the fact that Psalm was developed by Vimeo's engineers. But with these simple requires, you can add this to your projects, brand new or old or legacy, as we like to say. I'm not gonna dive into each tool's configuration today because there's that just doesn't sound fun or entertaining or useful. There's a lot of their documentation is very, uh, in depth, and I'm really just be regurgitating what's on the docs. But they have really, honestly, both these tools have impressively clean documentation. As a lot of us know, as engineers, you kind of get a hit or miss experience on if the tool you're trying to use is well documented or good luck is their documentation approach. Both, thankfully, both of these tools are very clean, straightforward and easy. But cool, we yeah we get it on our. This is how you install shit. Like we all know this, but like how like how do you how can I actually use this in my development cycle today? Well, I'm going to show you an example of how we use PHP stand at work from our Surface CI configuration file. It's going to look like a, a little bit of a mess because that's the nature of YAML files and cramming bash commands in the YAML files, but. If we take a look here, one of our run steps for our test workflow is performing static analysis of the application. We take things a little bit further. One of the benefits about PHP stand that we'll talk about later makes it to where you don't necessarily have to do all this stuff, extra steps that we're doing. But key things that you're looking for is right here in the middle where we're running, running a PHP stand analyze passing it a variety of different functions so we can get, you know, JUnit this for circle CI test failures that. It's a CI environment, you know, so no interaction, no progress, no ANSI. That one, one carrot thing to the XML file, flirt, I had never known this about bash commands. I did not know that you could actually control between standard error and standard out on Piping through PHP stand very frustratingly outputs a string first about which configuration file it's using. And without this, you get an invalid XML file. And then you have to do all this fun crap to strip the non XML out. And then I learned this hack and it's pretty great. And then we are doing a or 
true operation on this because the extra steps we take are we technically run the analysis twice once for our ci tooling to pick up the j unit file another time to generate a text file and we're also using this tool called diff filter it supports a lot of tools like php cs php stand psalm etc basically if you notice up at the top we're just generating a quick diff of the files that were actually changed in the feature and then running those reports through the tool for PHP stand to basically say like, hey, only like <clears throat> this 100 is basically saying 100% of it has to pass or fail. And then we're just making sure we're only running PHP stand focused on those diffs, like those files that actually changed. But we really don't need this step anymore. This was more of an initial like introduce this tool to an admittedly very hairy and messy product that we acquired so that we could start getting better code quality and standards added to the tool without having to rewrite the whole thing. I mean, we're kind of doing that anyway now, but now that rewrite's focused around making features better and not, holy shit, this was uh, tissue paper built on a foundation of sand. So let's go into our front end land. Here's a little bit of TypeScript that I've written um, in the past. That's kind of what I was referring to. Getting TypeScript is easy with this nice and admittedly smaller than I intended uh, npm install TypeScript, just that simple. And then create a .ts file and you're off to the races. Here we've got some lovely TypeScript that does compile into JavaScript. Uh, you can see we're using classes and constructors, we're typing our properties, we're typing the parameters to this project details method, we're even typing that it's going to return a promise that will resolve into the project type. Everything's great, makes it a lot easier to catch bugs like this. This experiment was basically me rewriting code that I had already written and deployed to production. Thankfully, that code didn't have to have a good looking user interface because it was just for our internal call center team, which is good because I suck at making things look pretty. Uh, but I can make things functional, which at the end of the day is really what matters, right? But I wanted to see, I was like inspired, like, oh, this is the first time I've really done front end development in a while because I was just doing API development. I want to learn something new through TypeScript data and I actually found bugs in what I took, like, was running in production when I rewrote this in TypeScript and was able to roll those fixes out to make sure our call center wasn't having issues because then having issues means lost revenue for us. And then, yeah, creating new types, we're using LUT, I probably use const, but you know, I was learning then. <clears throat> and then we have our promise resolve, return to type, and everything's great. Uh, I don't have a, an example of like a fully, fully like actually production tool that's using TypeScript. Our front end team at the moment is not using it. And immediately that's for a good reason. I don't, I don't think, and even our front end manager agrees that TypeScript is probably a bit overkill for a lot of what our front end team does, which is build landing pages. It just, we're a marketing type company. We throw landing pages out there, a form to capture information, submit it back to the system, and we help you find, uh, home improvement contractors to do whatever it is you're trying to improve on your house or fix, or maybe you want solar panels. We can help you find someone to get those solar panels installed. We are starting to have more front-end based applications that interact with these APIs. And those are the applications that I'm wanting to target for getting our team to adopt TypeScript. Unfortunately, the person on our team that was kind of helping lead that charge uh, just shortly before, uh, after the pandemic, wound up moving on to a different company. And with all the changes that were happening, with getting acquired, pandemic, the TypeScript initiative kind of fell off. So since my intentions are to tweak this and give this again at work, all of this is to hopefully kind of reconvince or re-inspire one of our newer front-end developers to lead the charge on getting TypeScript adopted. Speaking of ESLint, as I said, real quick, npm install save dev, make the node modules black hole even bigger, throw in a quick ESLint file to just set some basic parameters telling it to use the TypeScript ESLint parser, use the TypeScript ESLint plugin, 
a bunch of different extends, like the ESLint recommended rules for JavaScript. They have the same equivalent for TypeScript, and there's two plugins, but two different ones bringing in a bunch of different rules for ESLint. And when you run, ESLint is basically the not fully equivalent to PHP stand and Psalm. ESLint can do, it's a linter, so it's kind of got a different use case, but with these plugins, it gives you similar functionality. So if you have ESLint and all these configured, hooked it up into your ID, you're gonna see the errors ESLint is gonna throw when you try to build the code or that TypeScript would throw as well. We use the ESLint at work, but obviously not the TypeScript. It yells at me a lot because I don't do uh, style sheets correctly and then fix them. It's great or correctly for my uh, front end team, I should say. <clears throat> but ESLint is really where <clears throat> the tooling comes in to help you find these bugs before even the compilation, like running the TypeScript, the TSC command to go from a TypeScript file to a built JavaScript file that could run the browser. What about existing projects? I say in all caps aggressively for, a, I don't know, I think I forgot to change the casing on this. If you're anything like me, when I first learned about static analysis, this question might have gone through your head once or twice by now. I've kind of touched on the topic a few times here and there, but each of these tools do allow you to gradually roll them into your projects and develop pipelines. But how do they accomplish this though? Well, there is a difference between PHP and JavaScript. We'll look at the two options for PHP though, because they roughly use the same uh, approach and then we'll take a look at JavaScript. So for PHP, we've got PHP stand and Psalm running the analyze command or just Psalm with these set baseline. And then Psalm also comes with an update baseline command. <clears throat> In both tools configurations, once you generate that baseline file, you add it to it includes, or you set an error baseline file. And what this does is effectively grandfather in all of your existing errors that these tools are finding into the tool. So once you generate your baseline and say in PHP stand, you add this PHP stand baseline neon file to the include statement, and then you run PHP stand again, and it's going to pass because now it's just saying like, okay, all these errors existed for, since the beginning of time. We're going to ignore those for now. We'll fix them over development time. We just want to start focusing on making our new code free of bugs and a better quality. Just run this every day. Yeah, you could just run this every day, but then you're really not getting anything out of it. So please don't do that. But there are times where it makes sense to regenerate the baseline. I've done that a few times on one of our projects because of a typing error that I just could not get. PHP stand to figure out. And I couldn't tell if that was because PHP stand didn't support this yet. And I needed to file a ticket, probably, sorry, Andres, or if I was just doing something wrong and not figuring out how to do it correctly. And, you know, ticket estimates, time frames, all that. Had the code was working, had to get things moving. But one of the nice things is that if a grandfathered issue is fixed or the code is just refactored away, PHP stand will actually helpfully just fail the analysis with an error telling you that, hey, this error you ignored doesn't exist anymore. You could probably stop ignoring it. So then you can clean out, like manually clean your baseline file to re remove that ignore error because now it's gone. Either you deleted the code, the best feeling ever, or you cleaned it up through feature development or something along that line. Uh, ideally, over time, of course, would be to get the baseline file reduced to nothing, but every project is different. So maybe you never get this down to zero and that's fine. Maybe you get it down to nothing and that's even better because your code base is just super clean, typed and everything. Psalm on the other hand has this handy dandy update baseline command. It's their approach to resolving things. So like if you, fix issues that were in your baseline file, you can run update baseline and it'll remove the error from the baseline file because it's no longer there for you. But you can also always just regenerate the file and get the same result. If you need to grandfather in new issues, you will have to use the set baseline command because update baseline only removes errors that no longer 
exist from the baseline file. JavaScript and TypeScript. With the JavaScript scene, since TypeScript is built on top of JavaScript, it's like a superset of the language, if I'm remembering that terminology correctly, and it's compiled into JavaScript, you can actually intermix the code together. One of the direct ways, showing a configuration file, like I said, I wasn't going to, but it makes sense in this case, right up there, third line, allow JS true. With this in your TS config, it will be able to support both TypeScript and JavaScript files when you're building your project. A other approach is that it's kind of called out declaration true, which in the comments says generates corresponding .d.ts files. That .d.ts file is effectively a definition file. You can write these yourselves. And I, like in the example I showed previously, had to because some JavaScript libraries don't have TypeScript yet. So that when you try to use the two together, TypeScript will get a little bit complaining. You can just define the types for that library yourself in your own .dts file. And then TypeScript will be like, oh, okay, I know what this looks like now and not complain as much. It's all still valid code. It's just TypeScript doesn't know what's going on because it doesn't have a type file. And you can actually install type definitions directly through NPM without pulling a whole library in. I don't know the story behind that one, unfortunately, but it is there. And then either in CICD configuration or an NPM script, you'll run the TSC command and it's going to compile your type in the JavaScript. You've got it all mixed together. So you all just get your JavaScript stays JavaScript, your type comes JavaScript. Everything's great. And like I said, with those definition files, you can expand <clears throat> some TypeScript support to your existing JavaScript code or libraries without having to rewrite the whole thing to TypeScript. At some point, you probably will have time, or maybe you want to do that. But if you want to use it in a TypeScript project without rewriting every dependency, create your definition file off of the races. But alas, in its closing time, we have reached the end of our journey. I have been. Hunter Skrasik, I went looking for a more serious photo and then found this gift in my work machine from an old engineering all hands. You might recognize it as a recreation of the Brady Bunch, the squares, whatever the hell. But yeah, I'm Hunter Skrasik. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. I've been using PHP since like 2006 and building a career off of it for close to a decade at this point. I have lost track. A lot of things have changed since I've gone on this journey. And I know that there's still a lot out there to learn. and even more room for languages such as PHP and JavaScript to grow. And they will. We see it every day with our SC process. This belief of mine has brought all of you and myself here tonight to learn about the benefits of static analysis and the power of typed code. As our applications grow more and more complex and even more critical to the daily lives of our users, not just ourselves, we need all the tools we can get to write clean and bug-free production code. That same complexity is coming for JavaScript projects too, combined with an ever-changing landscape that is JavaScript and the you know framework of the weak meme. Anything we can to get the benefits of type safety and analysis will protect us from customer losing UI failures. <laughs> Excuse me. Where do I reside? I technically have a Twitter. You can try and contact me there, but I've abandoned that platform for many Musk-related reasons. But you can find me on Mastodon. I took the uh, time because I'm a maniac to actually host my own instance because I find that kind of thing cool and fun. So, you know, I have the power of the sun, I mean, data control in the palm of my hand by doing so, metaphorically, sort of, and still host on DigitalOcean. Gets fuzzy there. But either way, please feel free to follow or reach out to me on any of these platforms. One stipulation, this is my email. You're free to email me. I'm incredibly slow at responding to emails. So if you want quicker uh, assistance or conversation, maybe steer towards Mastodon. Or, or you can find me on the Texas PhD Slack as well. Either way, thanks for coming out this evening and choosing me as your edutainment. Does anyone have any questions? So um, this, is, this is a bit of a big question, but so uh, if you're going to, if you want 
But the fact about it, how long it can go. So if you're in the start of the model, I think this is where I start, then why even use PHP to begin with? Uh, uh, so, like, there's like, uh, like you have stacked up some sort of but it's like, if you're if you're not gonna like use the dynamic typing to the PHP standard, it's using PHP as a better type. Yeah, so the question was effectively if you're going to start a new project and you're going the strict type route, kind of using that declare statement from PHP and your type, you basically have your code full of types everywhere, then why would you use PHP instead of another language like Rust or Java or any of these compiled languages that are strongly typed from the outset? <clears throat> and that is a very good question. I think, I don't necessarily know if there's a right answer to that question because there's so many factors like if your team is a php shop and you're wanting to make your applications better and no one on your team knows like rust for example your business may not want to invest the time to teach its team how to program in rust or hire rust developers to write the strongly typed code but you already know php and php can support strictly typed code so you can get the best of both worlds. I think PHP is also, I don't even think there's a lot of studies that have shown that PHP, especially as we've gotten into eight with the JIT improvements, has gotten incredibly fast. Like it's it's not fully on par with a compiled application, obviously a really tiny Rust binary that's compiled for the system, running in your fancy minimized Alpine Docker container and all this mess is gonna be like sub sub millisecond speeds depending on your application and if that's what you need then you should absolutely go that route okay yeah and i think it's also like one of the strong suits of php and depending on who you talk to can also be the like achilles heel of php is that php code is really easy to write like someone getting into say like i have an idea for a business and i like roughly know my way around computers i want to build a website instead of using wix or whatever any of those squarespace i think is one of them I haven't watched many YouTube people recently being sponsored by them, so I can't keep up with that scene. But PHP is going to be a lot easier to learn for somebody who's new to programming than something like Rust, for example, especially because Rust has a very unique syntax to it. I'm not saying that in a bad way. I actually like Rust syntax <clears throat> a lot, but there's a very different barrier to entry on these two different languages. There are probably some easier than Rust to get into. Maybe Go, Java's taught a lot in high schools and colleges still. More power to you if you are somehow using C to build a website. I, I'm sorry if that's your life, but it works. It does work. And now with PHP WASM, Docker containers and everything, we'll soon be able to run PHP directly in the browser for reasons I'm still trying to figure out how that's useful. Uh, three val actually already does that. Well, e yeah, but outside <laughs> of three val, like it's JavaScript, you know what I'm talking what about. Three, Ian. What is three, what three val? Three val is that tool you'll see where people are like, oh, I found this weird like PHP interaction and you can just put code in it and it runs the code against like all the versions of PHP. Like yeah, like JS. Uh, so it's like Lego like Yeah, same thing. Follow up this for a static PHP project. Um, obviously, we talked about like some landing here in the difficulty is more like for the static PHP project. How do you sort of figure out at one point um, it's worth it to invest a second time versus uh, feature development or whatever the kind of DP says that like. Uh, as much as I hate to have to, uh, real quick, repeating the question. So if you're you're sticking with PHP and you're going to start using one of these tools, PHP Stand, Psalm, or any of the others that exist in the space, how do you decide when to implement those tools and fix the bugs that they find versus? Yeah. So 
got a production product, how do we add this code? How do we add this to our processes without affecting things like feature development and velocity in that manner? As much as I wish I wasn't giving you two back-to-back, -back, it depends. It depends. I like it really just does from team to team. For example, my work, I I gave a presentation a long time ago on what PHP SAN is and what it does, and people are like, oh, look, that's cool. But there wasn't really much of a conversation. And then one day I just said, screw it, because I have the benefit of being like a tech lead for one of my projects and just crammed PHP stand into one of our new projects from the beginning. And from um, there, so defined. That, that's actually a really good answer, actually. Like, if we're the tech lead and then ask for a model answering. Maybe, like, you should definitely work. <laughs> I, you know, let, let us know how it goes and we'll come back to that topic next month. But I, I basically introduced the tool to the team and then finally said, okay, I'm just going to throw this into a project so that the team can actually see a real world example. And very quickly was the light bulb O moment. And then from there, we rolled PHP stand into our project scaffold. So now every project we start with Laravel and PHP has PHP stand pre-configured. My team is running some of the few projects that actually run PHP stand on almost the strictest rule set. There are different ideologies on how you should pick your rule set levels. It really just depends on what your team's focus is and what you're trying to solve. I was seeing conversations around, yeah, like add it to a project, generate the baseline, set it to the max strictest rule so you can just have like the cleanest type safe code going forward ever and that's actually what we did for the project whose code i showed off of that phone intelligence thing was that easy no it threw a lot of errors and we actually had to technically back php down from its special like strict rule which is like stricter than the highest rule because that basically added a you cannot use the mixed return type at all. And at the time with the PHP version we were on, it was either used mixed or remove the type text from that code. So we had to back it down one level lower. Now things have changed. We could probably try and bump it back up, but we have uh, other focuses and things to work on with this project, including my first ever experience with regulatory things. So it'd be. All right. If nobody has any other questions, thank you all so much. Please reach out if you do afterwards. And I'm going to turn it over back to you, Ian, real quick. All right. Um, thanks, Hunter. And yeah. So uh, next up, Daniel. So the uh, production quality here will be much lower than Hunter's. I know you said you're not going to make things look good, but um, I also promised Ian this will be a lightning talk, so you don't have to stay here for another hour. This will be 15 minutes max. Oops. Back like everyone only wants USB yep. on one side. We are live. Nice. Okay. So, um, oh, I see. Which screen is presenting? There we go. I could have done speaker view, but there's my bells. All right. So, Uh, it has a full screen option. Today. There we go. You're good. Okay, cool. Okay, so um, for this talk, I wanted to do a, um, a small dive into one very specific feature in MySQL that I don't see talked about very much, and which, as far as I can tell, there isn't even a single YouTube video about, which really surprised me. Uh, I also could be really bad at searching YouTube, I'm not sure. But it's, all, it's such a small feature that there's not even a full page dedicated to it in my SQL documentation, uh, but you will find a section on it on the page for creating indexes. 
So this talk is about multi-valued indexes in MySQL. Has anybody used, this is not the same as composite indexes, has anybody used multi-valued indexes? One, awesome. Was your experience good or bad? I think it worked. Like before you use it, like uh, before you use it, if you try to like select by some of the values, it would be really slow. But after it starts using it, it's really bad. Work. Okay, so it works for you. Um, I, I think perhaps the reason it's not so widely used is because there isn't a lot of information out there on how it's performed for people. So, uh, and I have also noticed that it can feel a little iffy at times. So, uh, use with caution and test out if you're going to play with it. But I think it is really cool. And for certain use cases, I think it would almost be essential um, if you decide to design your database a particular way. Yes. When you just explain, doesn't it tell you to use like the query that basically requires to act? That's very possible. I've, I have not seen my SQL telling me to use it, but I also am not very good at explain. So yeah. um, I guess that's a big caveat is I'm not a database expert here. I'm just a, a PHP turns TypeScript guy. So um, my SQL is not my uh, forte, but this is a cool feature I've used, so worth checking out. Or DBA, got it. <laughs> yes. Okay, so what's a multi-valued index? This is extremely simple. If you imagine a, a non-composite index, although we'll get there in a second. If you imagine a regular index, it looks like our list here on the left. It's just a bunch of items, but only one uh, piece of information per uh, row in the database. Multi-valued index can have an array for each item or for each row in your table. So uh, what is this useful for? It's useful for JSON columns, yay. But you might be thinking I've indexed data from JSON columns before, that's not special, but you haven't. You've only indexed a single value from a JSON column, I'm pretty sure, and if, if I'm incorrect, let me know. <laughs> uh, so what you can do with these multi-valued indexes is you can, uh, target very specific queries and build an index that supports those better or at all compared to not using them. So I don't know why the title is missing there. Oh, there we go. Okay, so these are the three functions in MySQL that can take advantage of a multi-valued index. Member of, um, JSON contains and JSON overlaps. Member of and JSON overlaps are pretty similar to each other. I've not really used member of, uh, but they do similar things. I'm gonna talk about the last two and we'll look at examples of those two. So JSON contains, you use this if you want to say, does this array contain uh, all of the items that give you, whether that's a single item or an array of items. So you could pass it a string or a number and it'll tell you if that indexed array um, contains that that number or string, or you can give it an array of numbers and strings and it'll, it'll give you uh, a result if all of those items are contained. JSON overlaps, again, title messed up. JSON overlaps is uh, an any operation. So you can say, hey, does this array contain any of these items that you can give it a full list? So it gives you kind of a, uh, an easy way to say, um, you know, is there any overlap between these two things? So this is kind of small, I understand, but I couldn't figure out how to bump the font size on the code uh, here. So, and again, the title came in, I guess that's what I get for cloning each slide. Um, it's a very simple uh, syntax for creating this index. You create a JSON path uh, um, way of searching a column, and then you cast that as an array. Um, so in this particular case, I have a column called meta metadata, and then inside of there, I am going to have uh, an object property called tags, which is an array. And in this case, it's going to be an array of uh, strings. There, you're kind of limited. We'll get to that on what can be contained in the array. Um, but you could, it could also be numbers. And then you could also use these in composite indexes. So in this case, um, I'm indexing category, owner ID, and then my multi-value index after that. Okay, so here's a link to the, uh, I mean, it's really easy to find, just search multi-value indexes, MySQL, and you'll get here. But there are caveats, restrictions on how you can use these. 
I'll look at a couple of those. Uh, among other things, uh, arrays cannot contain null items. Um, you can only have one multi-valued index in a composite index. So that restricts your use cases pretty significantly. Um, you cannot use this index as um, the first uh, item in a multi, or sorry, in a composite index. Uh, you can also not use it as the primary key or for ordering. So I think those are pretty, for similar reasons, I think that's why those restrictions are there. And then you're also kind of limited in, if you're using an array of strings, you're limited in the character sets. Um, and there's more information about that in uh, the documentation. That is all the slides. So I'm going to jump really quickly into. Why is it going back? Well, I'm going to jump into my SQL really quick so you can just see, you know, if you wanted to, or sorry, to VS Code, if you wanted to create this index inside of migration, you can just use your uh, DB statement command here and add this index after you create a table. So in this case, I've created a post table. Um, which has a couple columns, including a JSON column for metadata. And uh, I've created two indexes, a regular one, uh, sorry, a single index with the multi-value uh, data and a composite index. That, uh, these are just the same ones that were on the slides a second ago. So uh, I also used Laravel factories to spin up a bunch of these. So we have two tables, one with the indexes, one without the indexes. And uh, each one of those has the same exact data, 3 million rows of posts. So not, uh, you know, big data, but not nothing either. And I'll go back to the plus here. I'm going to see if I can, there's a way to increase the font size. Plus. Well, I can, I can command plus for this screen, but it doesn't work for the results. So I have to go to preferences. There is a way. I've done it. Can you go to the other window, for example, and then the command button? Well, I can also, I can do it from right here. Nope, oh, wrong one. Uh, I wish there were a way to just like do a preset, or maybe there isn't, I just don't know about it. Okay. Um, does this work? Well, okay. I can't get that little footer to tour, but that's okay. We're, we're not going to be using that. Okay, here we go. So uh, we've got this post table and this post alt table. The alt table does not have uh, the indexes. The reason I did that instead of just telling my SQL to ignore the index is that this is one of those things that I think might be a little buggy with it if you. If you have a table with a multi-valued index and you try to run a query and tell MySQL to ignore that index, it, you're going to get different results back depending on whether you're using not slower, different results. Uh, so that's kind of odd. And so that's why I'm using these two separate tables to demonstrate this. I don't know what the reason for that is, but I've run into that pretty consistently. So here's our 3 million rows. You can see our metadata. Uh, is just the tags. There's nothing else in there, but you could have other stuff in there. That's the great thing about JSON columns. And so I have some examples here, which will show you uh, what some decent use cases are for these indexes. It is not uh, a perfect solution for any time you have a JSON column and you want to index this kind of data. As you'll see, there are a couple of cases here where it is slower to use the index, and I don't know why but it, it can be. So this, I think, is one of the, the great use cases when you're looking for a single item. So here's our post table. Uh, we just want to pull all the posts that have this one tag. I'm going to run it a couple times so we can see. You know, what if you try to run explain? Um, I'm sure that would give you lots of information, but I don't know how to read explain that well. And um, I can show you all what it says here, too. And it'll tell you, you know, yes, it's using the index, but um, I, I don't know how to get more information beyond that from it. Okay, so this, and I know that's really tiny, you can't see that, but this is a fairly slow, oh, it's running the second one. I wanted to run this one. 
Stop. Okay, so running on our indexed table, if we're just fetching all those posts, after a couple of tries, we're getting around half a second. If I run this on the other table, so the first time, four seconds, second time, okay, it looks like it's gonna be pretty consistently around four seconds. So pretty significant improvement for this particular query. What was it before? Uh, we got we got it to half a second on the index table. Um, not amazing, but um, and you probably wouldn't be doing this very often where you're fetching, you know, out of three million rows where you're fetching everything that has a particular tag. So let's do this one. We're using JSON contains again here, but we're passing in an array. So we're asking, and this is a slow one, slower on the index table, which I find interesting. But this will be a use case where you might not want to use this. So I'll run this a couple times. But the first run, we're getting oh, almost nine seconds. Three million? What? Yep. I mean, it's a MacBook Air. <laughs> it's a MacBook Air. It is an M1. All right, but on the non indexed table, it should be about half of that. Yeah, four seconds. So, pretty strange for this query. I wonder if it's even faster on the second run. It's still about four seconds. So, and then the same thing would happen if you use JSON overlaps. In this case, um, we're saying, you know, do any of these tags exist? Sorry. Sorry. Uh, this is the multiplier. It's like this. Is, so this one that I just ran is that's eleven seconds, but it's going to be faster without the index. So these are queries that you probably wouldn't want to use this index for. Is there a way to solve this? Probably. Or yes. Okay, so without the index, let's see if we what it is. I think it's gonna be about half of that again. Okay, ju yeah, just around six seconds. So those are not your best use cases. Where I think these really shine is in the, the composite index situation where you have a specific uh, a lookup that you know you're gonna be using in your app and you design your composite index around that. So that will look like this, where we are fetching uh, all the posts that belong to a particular user that are in a particular category and which have uh, a particular tag. Uh, and our composite index covers all of these. And this query will run in eight milliseconds without the index. One and a half seconds, although I think it'll typically be lower than slightly lower. Yeah, one and a half seconds. So that's a huge difference. And I think that is probably, this is where I've used these in real, the real world um, with, uh, you know, a large table that I'm filtering on a bunch of different columns and the multi-valued index has really helped slim down uh, those queries where I have a very particular query I've run it over and over. And then uh, with JSON overlaps, we'll see a similar performance. So 12 milliseconds for the index table. And again, about one and a half seconds for the non index table. So, uh, you know, if you have, were running a, uh, some kind of blog where you have this kind of lookup where you want to be able to fetch by user and category, um, you could totally use this and it would be very usable for the web with this, you know, sub 10 millisecond query. And that's all I've got for y'all. Um, I'll take questions, but again, I'm not an expert, so uh, most likely it'll be check the docs, but does anybody have any questions about these? Thank you. All right. So I'm using it for uh, 
a table that contains this is it's not for work no it's uh, another project a table that contains a bunch of data from foursquare which is about nine million rows and there's some um, category information on there and without the, without the multi-value index i mean there's still very slow queries like they're there's stuff I have to do in a few jobs, but um, it cut it cut, cut them down significantly. But it's still approaching 10 seconds for some of these queries I'm doing because it's not the best structure. Also, those indexes you can do something interesting with the multi-value index, which I didn't show here. Is if your uh, array structure is nested, um, which in the particular use case I have the force where they are. So what your the category. Um, column has an array of arrays and each of those um, second level arrays has category names uh, you can combine those into a single flat array using the json path syntax and then you can fix that so um, that is super useful for that particular use case i don't know why you would design around that if you could in this case i could have but i was using existing data so I didn't want to have to restructure that. Um, but there could be other interesting use cases there of combining, you know, using the JSON path syntax for a very particular kind of query. Yes. So um, the other database that I have similar Repeat the question for the two other databases offer this, and what's the performance difference? I do not know, and I do not know. So presumably document stores will offer something like this. Uh, I don't know what it looks like in the SQL world. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's a very like niche feature within my SQL. So I would imagine it might have to be like faster and like those Yeah, I would imagine somebody else is doing it better, um, but I don't know. Good question. All right. Uh, I think they're unmuted. Me. Y'all there? Yep, we're we're here. We're here. Okay. Uh, yep. So just wrapping up, I think. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, April 2023. Hello. Uh, yep. And uh, yeah, check us out next month. We'll have um, a talk um, from a, 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 a someone that you will not want to miss. So, uh, but we'll get the event here posted soon. Um, and uh, thanks again for joining us. Um, and have a good rest of your April. <laughs>